Episode 4, the final selection. Which I have a feeling is going to be the tournament arc. I knew it was going to be scent related. <laughs> I mean, it's instinct, right? That's what it is. There's something so remarkable and special about that feeling. I don't know if it's exactly what he's talking about, but I get that feeling in sports sometimes where I know something before I know it, or I see something without seeing it. It's just there. It feels like some channel has been opened, you know, and there's no blockage or obstacles on my actions. I really wonder about things like this sometimes. You know, I think I probably come off as a spiritual person, and I think I am in a sense, but that's not my primary orientation. You know, I think my primary leaning is towards wanting things to be really sound and evidence-based. It's just that I feel I found my own path to things that end up seeming spiritual through that process, you know, like many roads, one path. I think there is something like objective truth that many different avenues of reflection can arrive at. I say all that to say I've had some really mystical moments in this regard. There was one time when, for whatever reason, I felt like I could command animals and I put my finger in the air and a fly landed on it. It felt like I had control over it. It was super weird. It probably just a coincidence, right? But why did I put my finger in the air at that moment? Why did I have that feeling right before the fly landed on me? Maybe it's a false memory. Maybe it happened just by weird chance and my mind constructed a story around it. I think I've spoken about times where that trickled out into more than just moments where I've felt like I was in total, control's not the right word, but where I had this sort of purity of action, where I felt unrestrained and immune to pain and in an elated mood. And looking back at those moments in hindsight, I feel like it's likely that there was a, a great delusion happening there and that I was posing a great risk to myself. But I also can't help but wonder if I hadn't tapped into something, you know, if that state isn't available, if I could get certain obstacles out of the way. Nice of you to show up. That was honest. Thanks for believing in me, teacher. <laughs> oh, you get a head pat. Look at this. Tanjiro also appreciates a good head pat. He belongs in this channel. What kind of tournament is this? <laughs> if your life's at stake. These demon slayers don't, don't mess around. It's all break this rock this and don't die that. But before we go, it's time for some delicious anime shabu shabu. <laughs> you can't be a protagonist without a good appetite. It's against the rules of anime. <laughs> it's sort of hilarious he says there's nothing more he can do for him, since he just spent the last year and a half not being there. There's also something very All Might Deku about it in a way, where it starts as a mentor people thing, but the pupil has so much talent, the teacher becomes irrelevant. Hi. Just once I want to see an anime protagonist that just doesn't like food that much. I'm sure this demon universe goes deep too. <gasps> Does he get a mask? You've joined the mask gang. Oh, it actually has a purpose, besides looking amazing. As a former teacher, I can say that I think that this kind of moment was rare, but was also the most rewarding out of everything. There's this feeling you come across sometimes with certain people where you realize that they're bigger than you. You're the teacher and you occupy that role of wisdom, let's say, or authority or knowledge on the topic. But you meet certain people who have this potential, you know, they have this spark and you realize there's nothing deeper holding that in place except for just tradition. But that's what you want, I think, if your goals are all incorrectly. You want people to be great at the skills you're teaching them, right? That's why you're teaching it to them. The world is made better by their talents. You might be able to give them that first nudge, right? That first push to get them rolling. But then at some point an engine kicks on and it's all them. And they go faster from that point on than they ever have gone before and that you've ever gone before. One of my favorite memories in my life was the culture festival at my school in China where one of my students read my fortune. That was a significant event, not only because the fortune mostly came true, but because of the skill and depth of the English language she was able to use in doing so. I kind of love this mask too. And it's time for this plot convenient sleepy sickness to wear off so we can hit the road. Wake up. The plot demands it. Oh, did she just stay there? <laughs> Got it. She'll wake up when we need her. Who? <laughs> they... Wow. Wow. They were spirits. They did not actually appear in a live form. Something supernatural is going on. That ghost children thing just opened up a lot of doors. You know, because there's nothing at all supernatural about demons. Yeah, just your normal village. How come no one's moving? No, no, no. <laughs> 
Oh, this is it. We this is the tournament. We got there fast. I thought this was a pit stop. It's like a save room. Could you explain a little more about the point system? Is there like a kill score and also a team or rescue score? That's true. The rules are a lot more lax than I thought. It's survival, although maybe it's going to be insanely difficult anyway. It's Demon Sue. Yeah, it's gonna be a huge struggle no matter what. No matter how talented he is. For all the top-notch training he's done, there's nothing that could prepare him for an actual battle, short of actual battles. I mean, I think the training was probably the best it possibly could have been, given the fact that it raised his conditioning, you know? There are always these base skills that will be useful no matter what, but then when it comes to the nitty-gritty details or the elements that contain things as complex as human choice and interaction, it's not something you can do this sort of cold preparation for. There's going to be a huge learning curve, and to that extent, the success of the training will just be judged on whether or not it's enough to keep him alive long enough to learn what he needs to learn. What you can do, though, is breathe. Yeah. Make your bones excited. They're the threads, yeah. He just killed those- Well, did he kill them? You gotta smash the heads, right? He definitely decapitated those demons without any qualms or hesitation. Oh, they're dead. <laughs> I thought that was gonna be a thing. It wasn't. That's convenient. Where have we heard this before? If you can't get to the neck, hit the ankle. <laughs> Cold. Is it going to be one of those mutations? An abnormal? Hope these two make a comeback. Hey! Ask and you shall receive. I'm guessing he's going to come up against whatever it was that killed the two children. Is it going to be this thing? Well, now's your chance to get those rescue points. You just missed your chance to get those rescue points. This guy's eaten a lot of Demon Slayers, and there were only like five of them to begin with. But are you breathing, Tanjiro? Oh, damn. <laughs> well, that was awesome looking. Rescue points and attack points. This guy's a little bit behind at the times. That feeling when you totally missed the Meishi period, am I right? And he's using their hands even. That was a really dark turn on him. So yeah, it does seem like this is the demon responsible for the deaths of those kids. It also just adds so much more weight to what the, the teacher said about please don't die. It's sort of amazing he's still going at this point. Teaching kids. This guy's got an optimistic streak, I guess. I think I know which two he has mine. It's sort of weird that they wear this mask. It's, it's like a designator, a target on their backs. Right, it's sort of weird. Is, does he just not know? Is it intentional? Is it negligent? Well, you definitely woke him up. Remember your breathing. He just did the same thing to Tanjiro that he explained doing to the girl, and Tanjiro fell right into it. Oh no! Ward off this fist, am I right? I don't know, so many kids have died. Probably used to it by now. <laughs> The whole ghost thing opens up a lot of doors. Right, but he can just regenerate. None of this matters. Right. He gotta get to the nape. I would say cut off his ankles first, but I don't think he has ankles. Why do the sword swings feel so satisfying in the show? Well, that rock's gonna end up being really, really great preparation for this Annie Diamond Neck that he has. 
That explains very directly the utility of this training. <laughs> we just spent a year and a half attacking this rock. Alright, I guess will be your death. There's the thread. It was very satisfying. <laughs> what? It's over? One thing I'm starting to see emerge in this show that I really like is this sort of, I don't know how to explain it. Each episode is obviously building the main character and I guess the auxiliary characters and the world and the larger plot. But at the same time, there's something that works as these kind of bite-sized Greek myth-like parables. You know what I mean? It has the same vibe as these sort of ancient legends that you don't know why they're so compelling in their weird magical storytelling, but yet they are. Like the fact that he spent a year and a half fighting a rock with without understanding why, and then taking the head of this larger-than-life rock-ish monster is pretty great. I thought the last episode worked really well as a standalone episode, just sort of having Tanjiro fight a literal rock in a test of wills, and being unable to make progress until it, I guess, had a face or had some emotional resonance or had human form and in channeling his energies and sort of forgetting about the problem was able to surpass and obtain victory over the problem. But then this episode comes along and that's made even better and more interesting by the fact that the rock served a greater purpose and the people who helped him overcome that obstacle did so with a deeper awareness of what was at stake and what the required skills would be, making it extra satisfying when Tanjiro has that sort of moment of channeling the power and listening to the lessons he learned and overcoming this horrific obstacle and what, what became this very long running collaborative effort. I keep coming back to the myth thing in my head even though I can't quite explain what I mean by that. I'm trying to think of examples of that. There's Theseus who gets help in defeating the Minotaur in the form of Golden Thread which is the perfect task to escape the labyrinth and Perseus who fights the Medusa with I think a mirror if I remember correctly which is the perfect tool to defeat Medusa and the fact that it's gods mirroring the ghosts or spirits in this show that end up recruiting them to help with this this conflict, seeking a hero who can resolve these earthly matters. Perhaps a common thread in these examples is a mortal or semi-mortal being aligned enough with the spirits, let's call them, to the point where they can slay the invincible seeming or do the impossible and advance humanity or at least their community in the process. It's human ingenuity and creativity and power with the intrigue of the supernatural and this sort of fairy tale like feeling. I hope that continues because it's really cool. So that's the end of this episode. I'm wondering if the tournament continues or if we didn't just kill the, the final boss of this place. It seems like we've beaten the tutorial boss and so now it's time to actually get out into the world map maybe.